When you think of the first tank, what comes to mind? For most, it would probably be the British Mark 1-5 tanks, which entered service in 1916 as they were the first tanks to see combat, whilst for others, it would probably be the French FT-17 tank, which entered service around a year later in 1917. This is because, despite not being the first tank to be built or, like, see combat, it was the first proper tank with a rotating turret crew compartment at the front and a engine compartment at the back. However, a few years before either of these, there was another tank, one which also had a turret and was designed to be much faster than the British or French designs. This is the story of that tank, the <coughs> Boisten Amottegeschutz. Sorry if I butcher all of the German words in this episode because I won't lie, I'm not German. The German's hard, so I'm probably going to mess up a lot of things. Now, to talk about this vehicle, we first need to talk about the man behind it, Gunther Busten. Busten was born in 1879 in what was then Austro-Hungary, and after gymnasium in Vienna, he joined the <coughs> Pione Kadettenschule, engineer cadet school, located in Heinberg an der Donau. In 1899, he joined the <coughs> Eisbahn und Telegrafen Regiment. Railway and Telegraph Regiment of the Austro-Hungarian Army. From 1902 to 1904, he served in the military hub of Hola as the commander of the local fortress Telegraph Squadron. And now, with this background information out of the way, let's see where he got the idea for his vehicle from. On March 15, 1903, during his service in the harbour of Pola, his cousin, who was a marine officer, invited him to come along on a torpedo boat trip. During this trip, he was impressed by the ship's speed, power and protection, and the idea of a land torpedo boat began to emerge in his head. A few years later, now in 1906, at the 6th National Automotive Exhibition in Vienna, he saw the Austro Daimler Panzer Automobile, an armoured car. He saw this as something with a potential, however he considered the four small wheels as unsuitable for off-road travel. Now onto the design itself, there is not that much detail for the full design, as apparently Boosten was not allowed to patent the complete design, rather he was only allowed to patent the arms, which we'll get onto later, and this meant that he had to leave out many details for the rest of the vehicle. So let's cover what there is, one by one. First of all, the overall shape would have been a box-like structure with an upper glacis plate that was heavily sloped. Behind it was the curved base for the turret. Now, the turret itself would not have been able to rotate a full 360 degrees due to the compartment behind it, and the maximum rotation was estimated to be around 300 degrees. Now for the main armament, which would have been some sort of quick firing gun, and whilst many sources often interpret this to be a 3.7 centimeter gun, a boost in himself only mentioned it to be a 3 to 4 centimeter gun, so it could have been anything in that range. Now, inside the turret there were actually two gunners, who sat on the left and right of the main gun. Secondary armament is said to have consisted of two machine guns which were probably meant to be fired through the several vision ports also present in the design. The third crew member, the driver, sat in a compartment behind the turret with three vision ports facing left, right and behind. Apparently he also had to pass ammunition which would have been besides him to the two gunners in the turret. And now I think you can begin to see the main problem with this vehicle which is the fact that if you look at the design, it looks like, like the driver can't actually see in front of him and is meant to be facing backwards, which means the driver is driving the vehicle backwards and he has to pass the ammo to the two gunners in the turret, which makes the whole idea of having two gunners a bit pointless if you think about it, because yes, there's two people to shoot the gun, which will definitely help. However, if the guy who actually passes the ammo for it to be loaded is, is also the driver, the whole process is still going to be slowed down greatly by this, and the driver himself will just be very, very overworked as a whole, and it's kind of interesting because this is very similar to a lot of later vehicles, such as the French one-man turret vehicles, which had the problem of the commander being overloaded, of course, having to shoot the gun, load the gun, command the tank, and so on, whilst here it's the driver who has to drive the tank, help load the gun, and even one more task which we'll get onto later. Now, when it comes to the tracks, most sources point to the idea that he was completely unaware of the Holt tractor which had been around since 1904, but only arrived in Austria-Hungary much later, and or rather he simply saw how the wheels of the heavy guns were equipped with plate chains to 
or reduce the ground pressure and he came up with the idea to use these around multiple wheels to create a band train. The engine was to be mounted in the rear of the vehicle. Wooston envisioned an already existing regular truck petrol engine to be installed which at the time produced an average of 40 to 60 horsepower. With this power he thought that the vehicle reached 20 to 30 kilometers on road and 5 to 8 kilometers off road and 3 kilometers whilst overtaking obstacles. Now notice how this is much much faster than I guess the British and French designs of the First World War which I'm not sure about the top speeds of right now but I'll make sure to put them on the screen right here so you can have them as a comparison. And when it comes to the size of the vehicle, without the arms which I'll get on in a second, the vehicle was to have a length of 3.5 meters and a width and a height of both 1.9 meters and the turret was to have a diameter of 1.3 meters. In terms of protection, Boston envisioned 8 millimeters at the front, 4 millimeters on the sides and rear and 3 millimeters on top. The armor on the front would be thick enough to much protect the vehicle against infantry fire but it would not be enough against artillery fire and shrapnel. Boston knew this but believed that the crew should be able to disable enemy artillery with their own gun, which I'm not exactly sure how combat works at that point, like I won't lie, I'm more into the, I guess, vehicles and not the combat tactics and such and the layout of warfare at the time, but aren't artillery pieces normally much, much further away at a point where a direct fire is very hard or impossible, which kind of puts that idea in doubt, I guess, but I might just be wrong. Now onto the main odd part of this vehicle, which is of course the arms, which are very present, and you can see them because they're big and long. There were four in total, two at the front and two at the back, and the purpose of them was, as you can probably guess, to get over stuff. Like, what else are you going to use these for, right? They had small wheels at the end, which weren't powered or anything as far as I'm aware, but I'd rather just there so the arms did not, like, dig in and get stuck in the ground. Now, these arms could be raised and lowered with power from the engine, however, it is not specified how the engine power would be well transferred to these arms. Apparently, a hand crank was also included in the idea, however, that's unlikely to work, obviously, because can you imagine trying to crank a whole tank up just with the strength of your arm? Like, Jesus Christ, that would have definitely not worked. Just not a chance, okay? But it was still there for some reason. He thought it would work. It was a long time ago, to be fair. Anyway. Furthermore, the arms couldn't be operated from one position, the rear arms are operated by the crew member in the rear, so the driver, whilst the front arms are operated by the crew in the turret. And here we have, once again, the driver being overloaded with more and more tasks, so to get things straight, the driver has to drive the tank backwards, not being able to see what's in front of him, as far as I'm aware. He has to lower and raise the armors from time to time, and he has to pass the ammunition to the turret. This guy would have been so overloaded that it would have been just like I said earlier, like in the French designs and other one-man turreted designs from the 1920s and 30s, just with the driver instead, which is arguably worse to be honest. That's the main flaw with this design definitely, it's just the poor driver who has to do so many different tasks and probably has to face backwards. Now these arms, they do seem pretty genius on paper. Of course, the idea that you can raise your whole tank over massive obstacles. However, they were way too complicated, especially for that time period, and they would have most likely failed very often. And just the idea of slowly raising your tank during a battle seems a bit hopeful, as can you imagine being shot, being bombarded by artillery and so on, and you're just trying to slowly raise your tank over things. Like, that's just very hopeful, in my opinion, and... Well, when it comes to the western front at least, the arms would have definitely gotten stuck in the muddy terrain anyway, even if they had those wheels, because the surface pressure would have so definitely been just way too great for those arms to not sink in the mud. However, in World War, to be fair, the Austro-Hungary did mainly fight on the eastern front, the Balkan front, and the Italian front, which might have not had the same conditions as the western front. I'm pretty sure the eastern front was way more flat and less, I guess trenchy than the western front but i'm not sure about the uh, balkan and italian front so i can't really speak for those so that might have not been as much of a problem there but it still doesn't take away from this whole idea that you're slowly trying to raise your tank during a battle which just seems flawed in my opinion but i'm not sure might be wrong who knows now onto the last part which is the rejection of this vehicle to put it simply he sent the design to the war ministry in october 1911 which then said that it was an automotive matter so they sent it to the automotive sector of the army which basically told him yeah we aren't going to invest a lot of money into something unproven and new 
This basically meant if he wanted to build the vehicle, he would have to use his own funds, which he just did not have. Boyston didn't give up then and there. In 1912, he filed another patent, this time in the German Empire, and approached the German War Ministry. However, they also said no, for probably the same reasons. From there on, nobody picked up the idea, and Austria-Hungary went into the war with no armoured vehicles, and by the end of the war, only had a few, which were, as far as I'm aware, all armoured cars, with the only real tanks being used by the German Empire, but of course in much smaller amounts than the Entente did. And as for Boysen himself, he continued his military career until 1934, and his interest in tanks never truly went away. In 1935, he designed a tank trap, and after the Nazi annexation of Austria, he offered his services to the German War Office and made several designs, for which he was awarded the War Merit Cross 1st and 2nd Class in November 1941. His story ends in 1945, when he took his own life as he feared being taken prisoner by the advancing Soviet army. And that concludes the story of the Boosten Amotte Geschutz Interestingly, the man himself never actually claimed to be the inventor of the tank, however he stated that his design predated any English designs he knew of, and that the word tank was incorrect as that made it sound like something invented by the British, which in his opinion was simply false. And yeah, that's that's the end of the story. Now this part of the video isn't about the vehicle, but rather it's about the channel itself, so if you just came here for the vehicle, you're free to leave. But this is our first video, so of course, thanks for watching till the end, even though it's probably pretty bad as all first videos are, to be honest. Hopefully we get better over time. But I just want to give some information about the channel here, I guess. It's current between me, Jerry, and my friend Ayanand. I will be doing most of the narration, probably, whilst we split research and we kind of split the rest of the work. So, yeah, just us two working on this, I guess, with a full team. Welcome, welcome. And it's just kind of like a little fun hobby project, I guess. Just for fun, and because I guess we just have a passion for vehicles of war of all sorts. Aircraft, tanks, armored cars, and so on. Uh... And that does move me on to the next thing, which is research. Uh, we do have a passion for this stuff, of course. We aren't like the channels that just find and use the first thing they find, and they don't really care about anything but views. We do actually have a passion for these vehicles, which means we want the information to be as accurate as possible. However, we're still both kind of just kids, I guess, that are in school. We don't have full-time jobs or anything, so whilst we do have the time to search for this stuff, we don't really have the funds to buy really old and expensive books, so most of the sources will unfortunately be online sources as of now. However, we will still try to make sure the information is as accurate as possible, of course. However, if you do find any problems or errors in the information presented in this video, just make sure to let us know in the comments. And that's about it. Once again, thanks for watching. Goodbye.